so I just um, shared uh, on uh, WhatsApp uh, as well as uh, on Facebook. I mean, not Facebook, but uh, here on this chat. Uh, but I am not sure if the right thing was shared. So, <laughs> uh, okay, so it is. Uh, so sometime back, uh, I talked about this. I said that uh, at some point, uh, I am going to uh, introduce or share with you uh, this uh, particular uh, practice. Uh, in some ways, uh, I think this particular practice um, is uh, maybe gives us a little bit more. Uh, here is the kind of the, the irony, I think. Um, sometimes uh, we need a little bit more uh, because uh, some of the practices are so concise uh, that uh, we don't know what to do with uh, because uh, we need, you know, uh, more uh, kind of more to hold on to. Yeah. Mm, and so, you know, uh, so like the, uh, the uh, samadhi empowerment, you know, I think sometimes we feel like, you know, it is so concise. Um, we don't have enough to hold on to. Um, then uh, the practice, uh, as I suggested, you know, you just do short, short uh, sessions. It's better so that the practice doesn't stagnate. And the practice doesn't become kind of stale. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when it becomes stale uh, and you want something more, uh, so to say, uh, then you start to do things and that also doesn't work so well. Particularly when we are emphasizing uh, or uh, trying to at least, you know, uh, have a sense of uh, the Mahamudra approach to practice. In some ways, Mahamudra uh, is, 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 you know, like, uh, you know, from Gilbert and Bidget's time until now, <clears throat> many other masters have come, many other, you know, uh, figures in the Gagyu lineage across the Gagyu traditions, Drupa, Karma, you know, Taklong, Drigong. <clears throat> they have come and they have gone. And they have left behind a lot of manuals uh, on all the different ways to practice Mahamudra. So for sure, uh, there's quite extensive uh, material uh, on a more uh, systematic way of practicing Mahamudra. Mm, and so there are many possibilities. Uh, but I think again, before we get technical about it and formalistic about it. You can say that first and foremost, uh, what we kind of need to have a taste of, what we need to have an understanding of is more uh, the approach or the style or the flavor of Mahamudra. And so we, if we understand more and more, and that will take time and patience, uh, if we understand more and more the style, uh, the flavor, uh, the approach of Mahamudra, uh, then I think it's fair to say, according to Kyoba and Bache, um, all the other practices uh, can be done, uh, imbued by, informed by this uh, Mahamudra flavor. Mm, so this concise fivefold practice composed by uh, Gyawan Rinchen Punso, uh, um, it's the fivefold Mahamudra practice, which we have been 
talking about, when, which we have, you know, practice in varying uh, degrees. Mm. In this particular uh, text, which is a, a concise, short, uh, but very beautifully uh, put together uh, with very helpful, I think, uh, uh, parts to it um, that I would like to now share with you. And uh, it will become part of the repertoire. You know, we have the uh, Guru Puja practice, which is more on the front side is the uh, more obvious about that is to develop, you know, uh, devotion to uh, the Guru, the Guru principle. And then we have the Samadhi empowerment, which is very concise. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, this, uh, which is the most explicit of, the th of, of these three texts, uh, the most explicit using the rubric of the fivefold path. So here, bodhicitta, of course, is bodhicitta, nothing uh, too unusual. Mm, then the self uh, as idam, here it has a, a robust section. Like the samadhi empowerment is just one line, right? even half a line, actually, and says, you know, one self appears as idam. Here, as idam, and this idam, is an uh, excellent choice, actually, is Avalokiteshvara. So we're all very familiar with four-armed Avalokiteshvara. And in fact, uh, Kyoba Rinpoche said, you know, in various places in his teachings, he said to his disciples who come to him and said, well, I don't have a particular idam. And he will say to them, well, let Avalokiteshvara be your idam, because Avalokiteshvara is my idam as well. So if you uh, consider me as teacher and you say you don't have a yidam, then I encourage you uh, to adopt Avalokiteshvara as yidam. So it's Avalokiteshvara and more specifically is the four-armed uh, six-syllable mantra Avalokiteshvara. And so that is yidam. Yeah? And this uh, will include a section on chanting the mani. Uh, right? Then after that, uh, the guru uh, is Amitabha. So in the idam practice of Avalokiteshvara, no matter what sadhana, uh, explicitly or implicitly, Amitabha is seated, seated uh, on the crown uh, of uh, Avalokiteshvara. And so here, there is again a, a, a you know good section where um, Guru Yoga, uh, the Guru Yoga section is given. That's on page four. Yeah. Then uh, there you receive the four empowerments from the Guru. Then there is uh, the biggest section in this text. Is the section on the natural state, Mahamudra, uh, with pithy uh, prompts, words to prompt, uh, to guide us in how to uh, identify and how to practice uh, this essence of mind. And that is on page six, page seven, page eight. Then page nine, a four line dedication. Yeah, a four line dedication. So nine pages, very nicely, the fivefold path that we can practice. There is a um, video I just posted last night on Dugong uh, uh, Kagyu Foundation Facebook. Uh, this is a video uh, of a, a audio recording uh, of a teaching given by Bajong Rinpoche. Uh, Bajong Rinpoche is the uh, Lama, uh, the teacher who 
oversaw the rebuilding of the Gung Til after the Cultural Revolution. So in the 80s, he, he took the lead. He was also the main retreat master at Rigong Til, but he was also, uh, as, you know, oversaw the rebuilding of Rigong Til after the destruction during the Cultural Revolution in the 70s. And in that video, uh, you can see sort of the style again, the Mahamudra style. Uh, so first he talked about he did not explicitly talk about the fivefold path, but if you listen carefully, mm. the instructions he gave in that, you know, it's very much sort of like uh, how Kyopa, some of the Kyopa teachings that we've been looking at, you know, would, would sound like, you know, uh, seemingly not very organized, but actually, you know, he's giving all the essential advice. Uh, he talked about uh, reciting the mantra, you know, uh, he says, you recite the mantra, you know, it's Om Mani Padme Hong, or you recite the mantra of Guru Rinpoche. He said, but bottom line there is, it means, he says, you have to be like them. You have to behave like them. You cannot just recite the mantra and say you're practicing Idam, but you don't behave like Avalokiteshvara. You don't behave like Guru Rinpoche. There, in terms of that behavior, he talks about, you know, uh, the karma, uh, the 10 non-virtues, give up the 10 non-virtues. Then he quotes uh, uh, Atisha, interestingly, uh, which kind of my point, you know, that actually Atisha and Atisha's Kadampa teachings uh, is very central to Dapokagir. It might not be important to Milarepa, might not be important to Marpa, yeah, but Dapo Kagyu, uh, the Kagyupas descending from Gampopa, uh, Atisha and his tradition is absolutely uh, front and center, together with uh, Milarepa and Marpa's tradition. Uh, these two uh, combined together. Uh, that I feel is such an important characteristic of Dapo Kagyu. Um, unfortunately, nowadays, I think in the West, especially in the West, uh, uh, too many people who think Gagyu is Milarepa Marpa uh, forget Atisha's importance. Uh, then you get some kind of wild <laughs> Siddha-like styles, you know, and they want to say, oh, that is, you know, yeah, that is Milarepa, that is Marpa, Dilopa, uh, Naropa, but Atisha's uh, influence is just as important. So anyway, in that video, you should watch, you know, it can help you understand uh, as well. Uh, watch a few times, very short, you know, uh, like three, three minutes only, you know. Uh, but uh, he speaks very fast. So the English subtitle uh, is also very fast. Uh, so you have to watch a few times. Uh, it's only three minutes. Yeah. Mm. So this is the... Uh, uh, the practice of the fivefold path right? with Avalokiteshvara as Idam, Amitabha as Guru. Yeah. Uh, so um, I will read through uh, uh, on page one. Yeah. All mother sentient beings, limitless as the sky, I wish with compassion for their freedom from suffering and its causes. I wish with love for their excellent happiness. I aspire that they attain unsurpassed awakening. So this is basically compassion, love, and bodhicitta. Right? Bodhicitta as in uh, relative bodhicitta. Yeah. And for that, I will enter into the meditation of the fivefold path to generate the ultimate mind of the equality of all. That is absolute bodhicitta. Rel relative bodhicitta is the uh, aspiration uh, to free all beings from suffering, to have all beings uh, achieve happiness, and for them to be completely free to become Buddhas. And therefore, I need to become Buddha. And, and, and how do I become a Buddha? Finally, 
I become a Buddha uh, when I understand reality as it is. Uh, and that is absolute bodhicitta. Uh, so here, uh, laid out yeah, very clearly, right? This is what we're talking about when we say bodhicitta, both absolute and relative bodhicitta. Then, this union of absolute and relative bodhicitta, right? mm. in other places, in other sadhanas, you know, uh, so the emptiness and compassion inseparable gives rise to the deity. And so if you remember, you know, the uh, Avalokiteshvara practice that we uh, used uh, recently in some of the retreats that I've done uh, during Sakadawa, yeah, it says that. Uh, so the union of emptiness and compassion is bodhicitta, relative and absolute bodhicitta, inseparable, then gives rise to idam. So page two, from that state, in the center of a hundred petal white lotus and moon is my form as a white lord of Alokiteshvara, adorned with jewels and silks. I have one face and four hands, my main palms are joined like this, right? And the others hold a crystal mala and a lotus flower. Seated in Vajra posture, on the moon at my heart is a Khri syllable encircled by the six syllable essence mantra. Then in that state of being Yidam, you recite the mantra as much as you want. Recite mantra of Omani Pemihon. Then, page four. So now the third of the five aspects. Above my crown is the essence kaya, the essence uh, form, the essence body of my guru. So whoever your guru is, whether you know or you don't know, whether you have a reference point to someone living or not, the principle of this guru, understand that the essence of the guru, and not the external appearance of the guru, the essence of the guru is in fact Amitabha. So now Amitabha's form is described. Reddish white in color, seated in the posture of meditative equipoise. So both legs in lotus position or called Vajra position, hand, you know, in meditation yeah. and not explicitly described here, but uh, Amitabha also often holds a bowl uh, like this. Uh, then uh, in my guru's crown uh, is a white om, in the throat is a red ah, in the heart is a blue hum. Uh, and that's radiating light. Then by the power of praying with devotion through the three doors, body, speech, and mind, completely focused and devoted, you pray. And as a result of praying, and praying what? Praying for the four empowerments. So if you want, even here, you know, you, you can pause, right? By the power of praying with devotion through the three doors, you can pause here and take that section from the Samadhi empowerment, the seven point, right? In the Samadhi Empowerment text, yeah, it says uh, on page uh, five, whatever slight virtue I may have gathered through prostrating, offering, confessing, rejoicing, requesting, and beseeching, I now dedicate to complete great awakening. Great Guru, great Vajadara, please bestow the empowerments upon me. Guru, great Vajadara, please bestow the empowerments upon me. Guru, great Vajadara, please bestow the empowerments upon me. Yeah. Either those exact words, if you want, or just that sentiment, yeah, which is what it means here. By the power of praying with devotion through the three doors, praying for, supplicating for, the four empowerments. Then, light rays from the Om, 
in the Guru's crown, inside his crown. Light rays from that Om purify my body. So enter here. And I receive the base empowerment. Light rays from the Ah comes to throat, purify speech, and I receive the secret empowerment. Light rays from the home of Amitabha, from his heart, purify my heart, my mind, and I receive the wisdom, knowledge, empowerment. Then my guru melts into light and dissolves into me completely, and my two obscurations are purified. Now I have completely received the fourth empowerment. Let me take a real quick look. Lama Oshurantin Jim Ninja Wang Shi Malu. Okay, I, I will fix this translation a little bit. It's actually, uh, I completely receive the four empowerments. The last line is not referring to just the fourth empowerment. The last line is referring to all four. So you receive the fourth by the guru melting into light and dissolving into you and two obscurations. The two obscuration, the first one is obscuration of mistaken mm, belief in the self of persons, personal self. And the second obscuration is the mistaken belief in the self of phenomena, the essence that phenomena has essence. Those two are completely purified. Then the four, last line should say, with this, I completely receive the four empowerments without exception. So I will fix this and send you. Then at that point, you know, when Amitabha above your head dissolves into you, as Genesis, you also dissolve. You don't hold that visualization of yourself as Genesis anymore. So in ordinary uh, deity yoga practice, right, this is where we start the completion stage. So completion stage is, in this case, the natural state Mahamudra. So the fourth part of the five part Mahamudra. So on page six, Kunjaratna uh, gives some very, you know, very concise but very complete instructions. He says, First, he starts with the physical posture. He says, legs in the Vajra posture, meaning seated, stable, cross-legged. Yeah? The most stable way of sitting is to sit uh, in the full lotus, uh, which maybe all of us uh, cannot sit in. Mm. So the key point here is to sit stable. Body straight, second point. Chin tucked in, third point. Tucked in means you know, the head should not be like this. Yeah. It should be pulled in. Yeah. Not like that, you know, and cause strain to your back. Yeah. Like, ah. No, and just slightly in so that it's straight. So third point. Fourth point, shoulders broad. Fifth point, hands in mudra of meditative equipoise. Six point, uh, the rest in the gaze, uh, meaning your eyes uh, drop to about two to three feet in front of you. Uh, that's the gaze. Uh, you don't close your eyes. Uh, so resting in the gaze. Uh, so let both your sight and your mind rest in that gaze. The gaze, the eyes come to the tip of the nose and the nose uh, points to uh, that spot two to three feet in front of you. And so the eyes are actually following this line from the nose uh, to that spot two to three feet in front of you. So rest in the gaze, uh, six point, seven point. So these are the seven points of Virochana. Seventh point, the tongue is brought up a little, meaning uh, the tongue is resting on the roof of your mouth. So more specifically, the tip of your tongue touches uh, where your gums and your 
teeth uh, on the inside uh, means uh, somewhere around there. So these are the seven points of Vairochana. After giving that, he says, without striving to tighten or loosen, investigating what is and is not. So he says, drop that. Drop all judgments. Drop all kind of thinking, investigating. Is this, is this good? Is this bad? Is this? Is this not? Drop that. Rest as things are in the innate fundamental nature without meditation and without distraction. So be as natural as possible without meditation. What that means there is without like trying to meditate uh, and say, oh, now I want to meditate without doing that. And also without distraction. Uh, so it's a, it's like uh, walking this tight line in some ways, you know. Uh, to meditate, I need to meditate is one extreme. Uh, the other extreme is, you know, to get carried away by distractions. Uh, but don't do this. It says, rest uh, as things are. Which is, they are all. Uh, know that everything, everyone, no matter how crazy anything gets, seemingly, uh, they are all abiding in the state of that fundamental nature. By not wavering from this nature, the experiences of bliss, clarity, and non-conceptuality will arise as the naked primordial wisdom of realization. Here, there is a play between the word experience and realization. So normal forms of meditation, normal non-Mahamudra approach will say, uh, you should strive to achieve bliss, clarity, and non-conceptuality. So these are very advanced states of meditation. So these are valued as, you know, things that we should uh, work towards. But here it is actually not saying that you should strive for this. It is saying that when we do not waver, when we do not move from resting in that nature, even this advanced states called bliss, clarity, and non-conceptuality, they can develop by themselves. Then in the Mahamudra context, and Kyobarambache in Gongchik when we studied, you know, I don't remember if we covered this line, it says, you know, these three advanced states of meditation, if you deliberately strive for them, they become the three traps. So here, this last two lines is actually saying uh, all these things. First, don't, don't chase after these three bliss, clarity, and non-conceptuality. But if you have enough faith and confidence to just rest in that fundamental state, when any of these three turn up, not only do they turn up, but they will immediately turn into the naked primordial wisdom of realization. So, tokpa, realization, instead of nyam. So niyam, the highest kind of niyam is the experience of bliss, clarity, and non-conceptuality. Niyam is experiences. More specifically, experiences that arise yeah, when the mind is becoming more and more quiet, more and more present. Yeah? So all kinds of experiences. And sometimes these experiences can be terrifying. Sometimes. But with regards to these experiences, they always say, good or bad, don't, don't be distracted by that. But the best case scenario of these experiences are these three experiences of bliss, clarity, and non-conceptuality. But especially in Gilbert Rinpoche's teachings, he says, watch out for these three. 
I think for most of us, we don't need to fear this because we are not that advanced that we, we uh, routinely experience this. Uh, but for his students, you know, I'm sure many of them were quickly experiencing these three things. Then his emphasis was more, don't get stuck in them, don't get stuck in them, don't get stuck in them. Don't get stuck in them, don't get stuck in them. For us, I don't know. I don't, I cannot speak for you. For me, no danger of these three yeah, getting stuck in. Uh, if I can experience some of this, uh, it's really very good, you know. But the main point here is, even when the best of all niyams arise, if you know how to just stay in the natural state and rest there, then even these higher states of niyam that often meditators you know, get stuck in, you will not get stuck in because they will immediately turn into this naked primordial realization, primordial wisdom of realization. Then, free from contrived rejection and acceptance. See, this term, you know, we were reading in Gongchik, right? Uh, to not accept or reject. Uh, so, in this case, uh, it's saying, it's, it's saying, in the meditative uh, experience, then you do not uh, contrive rejecting and accepting. In the discussion that we have been doing from Gong Chik, that is about conduct. In terms of conduct, yes, be very clear about what you will adopt, what you will discard, what the Buddha has pres prescribed and what the Buddha has proscribed. But in the context of Mahamudra, cultivation, resting in nature of mind, you want to be free from oh, this thought is good, oh, this thought is bad. You don't do that. Free from contrived rejection and acceptance of all afflictive emotions, thoughts, habitual patterns, and conditions, sustain this innate fundamental nature, which is uh, the word uh, for this fundamental nature yeah, is uh, uh, the word that we have seen you know, mm. uh, let me look for it. Uh, she, okay. she some babki nailup, right? Rang she, rang she, uh, she, uh, she some babki nailup then, right? She, the fundamental nature, but the way it plays out, right? The first statement of Gong Chi. So, uh, this. This fundamental nature, the innate fundamental nature, sustain this. Then rests without the characteristics of change in non-elaboration. Non-elaboration means don't feed uh, the process of mentation. Don't feed the process of eye-making. Let go, let go, let go. So another way of thinking about this is let go, let go, let go. Anytime uh, the process starts uh, to manufacture an I, drop it. Let it go, let it go, let it go. And through this, obstacles are naturally removed. Progress will naturally happen. Through mastery of self-awareness, you will see your true identity as primordially Buddha. Your true... Uh, this translation was done by Eric. Uh, I, I like his translations. Um, but there are some things here, I think, uh, Maybe we'll massage a little bit, you know, so know that the English right now is still uh, kind of preliminary. Uh, I'll try to draw out uh, what uh, the words here are saying. Wang Zhuo Dang Bo, Sang Ye Rang Dong. Rang is the 
the self face shell is face uh, rang is self uh, so the your true face you know so here it's uh, less literal uh, you see your true identity uh, but your own face literally uh, like in the chinese tra tra tradition we call uh, lai mian mu, uh, your original face uh, which is a common uh, zen uh, expression uh, Wang Jo Dang Bo Sang Ye, like your, the, yeah, the Dang Bo Sang Ye, and primordially Buddha, like Buddha from the very start, literally, you will see your identity, your face is none other than Buddha from the very beginning, which is what primordially here means. Then he quotes uh, this famous uh, verse from Gyoba Rinpoche's uh, Fivefold Mahamudra Song, uh, which is, if within the sky-like expanse of mind as such, uh, which is nature of mind, the accumulated clouds of conceptualizations have not dispersed, the planets and stars of the twofold knowledge will not shine. Attend earnestly, therefore, to this non-conceptual mind. So yes, of course, you know, clouds, right, can never modify the nature of the sky. But nonetheless, on this side of confusion, we should let those clouds disperse. Because if they don't disperse, right, we have, we're not able to benefit from the sun. We're not able to benefit from the planets and the stars that are illuminating. So for that reason, even though ultimately we should not think, right? Thoughts and concepts huh, are actually real and therefore actually causing suffering. Ultimately, we need to understand that. But it's not enough to just think like that. You also need... Huh, to let those clouds, those concepts dissolve. And you let that dissolve in the Mahamudra way by basically not feeding them. So instead it says, earnestly attend to, earnestly kind of pay attention, nourish, focus on this non-conceptual mind which is the fundamental state, which is your true identity, and stay there. Next, in the space of the innate nature of mind as such, the dark and light realities of samsara and nirvana are like clouds. When adulterating concepts of things being good and bad occur, you do not know the way, the true nature of things abiding as they are, and the extent of the mandala of knowable things. When you do not know the true nature of things as they are, that's the first obscuration. The extent of the mandala of knowable things, meaning knowing everything. So our Gongjik lesson from Wednesday, the two things, right? Knowing emptiness and knowing uh, things uh, as they arise, and how they play out. So, so when we become lost in these clouds, uh, then these two, uh, the planets and the stars is what that's talking about, are these two wisdoms. Then we lose that. We do not know how they abide, which is they abide uh, empty. And we do not know, you know, how they manifest as the mandala. So here mandala can also mean mandala of confusion. Uh, often mandala is only, uh, we talk about mandala of Buddhas. But right now, we are in the mandala of confusion. So we don't see. Thus, transcending all clinging to characteristics of thought and non-thought, rest now in the natural state of Mahamudra, which is beyond concepts which cannot be reached by concepts. So these are the prompts 
Whenever you do this practice, when you come to this point, don't try to, uh, when you're doing that practice, don't try to like, you know, oh, what does this mean? What does this mean? Read through this once very slowly, but very present. No uh, rush. Read through this once smoothly. Uh, don't pause and think. Uh, thinking cannot get you there. Let them be prompts, and they can prompt uh, a recognition and experience. Once there is a recognition, once there is an experience that you you kind of feel this is it, right? Or this is part of what this state is. Just rest there. And if you don't read the whole section, it's fine also. Read to whatever the degree of this section, this middle, this fourth section. And if you ha can have an experience, right, of this fundamental nature, or what you think is the fundamental nature, it's okay. You just stop and pause there and rest there. And as long as the mind is content to just rest there, you remain there. Then when you know the mind wanders and you want to conclude the practice, and then maybe you can finish reading that section, then dedicate on page nine. I dedicate all the condition, uncondition, and existing virtue there may exist. So I and all sentient beings quickly attain unsurpassed awakening. And that is the uh, concise uh, fivefold practice. Let's take a break now. Uh, when we come back, let's see if there are any questions, uh, and then we can go do a little bit of gongjing.